Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. So today it's gonna get a little bit nerdy. So prepare yourselves, get some tea, get some coffee, whatever you need, get a glass of wine, have a seat, cause we're gonna get through how to read an ingredients list or an inky list as it were. So one of the most exciting things about the last few years is the interest that has arisen about skincare. And there are more brands than ever, there are more indie brands than ever, there are people doing amazing things with innovative ingredients, and it's not all just limited to huge corporations like Lauder and uh, L'Oreal and just the bigger brands. So we're able to do more innovative things because there are little brands who are taking chances, taking risks, and just willing to play around with more innovative formulas as opposed to the bigger brands that maybe are a little bit less willing to take risks like that. So one of the things that's changed though is it's become paramount that you as the consumer are able to read an ingredients list because we can't rely on just a uh, long-term history of amazing ingredients and amazing products. It used to be that something like um, the Advanced Overnight Recovery Complex from Estee Lauder was so popular and sold so well just because it had such a good track record of people knowing that it was around, knowing that it did good things for their skin, and it was decades that that was one of the reigning serums for, for anti-aging and, and for skin health. But with all kinds of amazing younger brands appearing, they don't have that long-term trust factor. You may buy into someone's story and, and really feel like you've connected with the brand founder, with their kind of ethos of the product or their the, the brand mission, which is great, but it's a little bit more difficult for you to go through and, and decide, oh, this is this is totally a product that's worth you trying because it's been around for years or I've heard about it from 15 other people and they all love it and can't live without it. Now if you're if you're active on discussion forums and YouTube and Instagram and things like that in the kind of beauty community you might get that kind of feedback more quickly but you have to be able to read an ingredients list and know what ingredients are and what it means if they're higher or lower or just how to decipher it. So. I wanna help you gain that skill and give you just some tips and tricks for um, how to decide if a product might be right or more risky for you. All right, so one of my favorite products, Jordan Samuel, younger brand, but still amazing stuff. And he's done a great job of creating really reliable products that basically all skin types can use and using um, active ingredients at lower concentrations so that you can pretty much always use them daily or twice daily on all skin types and not worry about irritation or things like that, but still get the benefits from those more subtle formulas. So ingredients will be on the back most of the time. As we all know, look for the ingredients list. Now some of the tips that I'll give you and some of the, the deciphering techniques are going to be unique to the US because of the way that the FDA governs labeling, um, but I'll try to touch on some of the things that govern the EU and other countries' labeling processes. We have our basic product. This is our first product that we're going to look at. Um, let's break it down. So the ingredients on the back, because this is a basic product and not a drug, we'll get to the distinction at some point, but basic product is going to list the ingredients. Now the ingredients are going to be listed from highest concentration to lowest concentration. There is no in-between. Um, generally they are going to list the Latin name and then in parentheses put the uh, plain English version. So we have Camellia sinensis, uh, which is green tea. So green tea water is the first ingredient in this. Generally you're going to see water bases, aloe bases, or um, silicone bases in some cases. <laughs> I'm rhyming. Uh, that's a problem. And I haven't even started drinking yet. But the first couple of ingredients are really what you're going to get as far as the base of the product goes. That means that um, when you have some vitamin C's that need to be in an oil suspension or an oil base, you're going to see the oils first. Carrier oils like jojoba and um, sweet almond and, and things like that are kind of neutral bases that you can mix things into and, and they do a good job of just kind of handing it off to the skin. Um, 
a lot of products do have water as a basic ingredient. That doesn't mean that they're diluted down with water. It just means that water is a lot of what goes into products. Um, whether it can come in a lot of different forms, but water is usually going to be one of the primary ingredients for things. And that doesn't mean that it's bad or or that you need to look for a more concentrated formula in most cases. It just means that a lot of what we put on our skin is going to be best formulated in a water base. It's going to have the right textures, the right emulsifications, the right solubility, the right kind of delivery systems. So don't get too worried if water is the first ingredient. It doesn't mean that you're paying for nothing. It just means that that's the highest percentage and that's what makes it the most desirable to put onto your skin. So down towards the bottom, what you're going to find are usually preservatives, um, thickeners, things that are going to keep the, the product stable, and potentially things that are going to be pH adjusters. Um, sodium hydroxide, let's see if I have one, here we go. So this one is uh, Paula's Choice, it is an exfoliant. As I've said, exfoliant, chemical exfoliants like BHA are very pH sensitive, so you do need something that's going to be a pH balancer to kind of adjust it. Now that may be citric acid, that may be sodium hydroxide, that may be any number of things, but in this one it is sodium hydroxide. Now, people get real bent out of shape about this one just because sodium hydroxide is lye. Uh, it's what originally was used to make soap. Uh, you would take fat and lye and that was kind of basically all you needed and you had soap. It is a very, very corrosive ingredient. Um, its pH is very extreme, but what it does is in very small amounts, it balances out those other pHs. So it doesn't mean that you're putting lye directly on your skin. It means that they had to do kind of a, a baking soda and vinegar moment to balance things out, and then you wind up with a different product at the end. Um, it gets very sciencey from there, but the basics is sometimes when you read an ingredient and it's a, a scary ingredient or it seems scary like lye or sodium hydroxide, it was put in during manufacturing, but it's no longer actually sodium hydroxide at this point in here. It's had its reaction and it's changed the pH. So you're left with, with kind of a different compound in there because the sodium hydroxide has done its job. So don't always get too afraid of that. If the formula works for you, go with that. It's working for you. It is a water base, but it has methyl propanediol. Now that's the second ingredient. And what that is, it looks a little bit scary, but it's an actual delivery system. So it helps ingredients penetrate into the skin without just evaporating away. It helps keep the skin happy so that it gives it a little bit of time to kind of absorb those ingredients and take it down deeper. So it's sort of the, the secret handshake or the secret knock on the skin's door that opens up those pathways so that the ingredients can penetrate deeper and get to where they need to get to. Sometimes formulas with methyl propanodyl or propanodyl on its own can leave sort of a slick feeling on the surface of the skin. It usually dissipates in the, in the first couple of seconds or, or a minute or two, but it is just that delivery system. So seeing something like that in the ingredient list up high, you'll know that it's gonna have a little bit of a slip to it. It's gonna leave almost a little bit of a gloss to the surface of the skin for a little bit, but it's gonna die down. And you should know that that's helping the ingredients get deeper. So that's one of the tips you can kind of piece apart from, a, um, from an ingredient list. Both of these have good examples of, at the bottom, it has sort of indicators of this one is Leaping Bunny, Leaping Bunny certified. That means that it's not tested on animals and it's indicating that you should recycle, reduce, reuse. This one has a couple more things. So it has some, it has a leaping bunny as well. Um, one that I wanna point out is this little bugger right here. So that little open jar and it says 12M on it. That means that once you break the seal and you open this product, it should be used within about 12 months. That means that they've tested it and it is stable. The formula stays good if you use it under normal conditions. That means don't keep it too hot, too cold, too dry, too moist. Uh, don't leave the cap off forever. But during normal usage, it's gonna last for 12 months and be effective that entire time. Each product, oh, here's another 12 month. Um, so this one is the Ordinary Lactic Acid. 
same thing. Encourages you to recycle, has a 12 month open after date. And then one of the other things that you might see are, especially more and more, is that sort of stylized E. And that means that the packaging is EU compliant. So that means that all of the packaging here, all the labeling, all the instructions, all of the um, sizing and fluid ounces, all of that adheres to the EU standard as well as the US standard. So, okay, so one more product. This one is a sunscreen, and this is where we're gonna get into drug facts. So, looks very similar overall to just a basic Jordan Samuel product, but first thing I wanna point out, this crimp up here can give you lots of information. Now on the front, it has nothing. On the back, however, there we go. On the back, we can see that it has an expiration date which is five of 19. Now it's not always super clear in there, but you can piece apart a month and a year most of the time. If it's not there for a drug, it's gonna be printed on the bottom label or somewhere on the side. It's usually gonna look different and have a different font than what's printed on the back because what they do is they mass manufacture all these bottles and then when they actually fill it with ingredients, they crimp the top with a heat seal and that's when they put in either the expiration date of that batch or they'll print it on the side or the bottom of the product. And again, that's unique to that batch or that lot of product. So you wanna know when that is gonna expire versus when this plastic was originally made, which could be very different times. Drug product. In the United States, um, the FDA governs drug products as being anything that intends to cure, treat, or uh, diagnose a disease. That means that sunscreens are intended to prevent skin cancer or treat sunburn, things like that. So if you flip it over, you're gonna have something that indicates drug facts right up here at the top. Sometimes brands, especially brands that call themselves cosmeceuticals, which is not a regulated term, it's just sort of a fluffy term, meaning we think we're special. But sometimes cosmeceutical brands or other brands will use this style of uh, ingredient list to make it seem as though there's a drug in here or something super active because the, the average savvy user knows that if it's, set, if it's set up like this and it's a drug fact, that means that there is something a little extra special in here that is meeting certain extra criteria and is under greater scrutiny than a traditional cosmetic is. So if it says product information, it's not, not anything special. It needs to say drug facts at the top for it to apply to what I'm gonna talk about. So SPF is listed on the front. On the back, we have drug facts. The first thing you see under drug facts is gonna be active ingredients. That means whatever it is in this formula that is special about it, that is trying to treat, diagnose, or cure a, a disease, as it were. Generally, it's sunscreens, but sunscreen at the top, it's gonna say the uh, percentage, well, the ingredient, the percentage that is in this formula, and then it will say the condition it is treating. So sunscreen, indicated the purpose is for sunscreen um, and it helps prevent sunburn. Hooray. If used as directed with other sun protection measures, this decreases the risk of skin cancer and early skin aging caused by the sun. So the first two bubbles are ingredients and then why is it in there? What's it supposed to do? Now here's where things get a little bit trickier. At the bottom is gonna be other ingredients. So these are things that are not active ingredients, um, at least not intended to treat or diagnose or whatever. This applies to sunscreens, acne products, um, skin protectants, any number of things. But in the US, this is where you can get really kind of shady, as it were. And this product, no harm, no foul. It's a great product. It works really well. It's a great SPF 30 um, from a local Colorado brand. But if you look really carefully, the ingredients, the, the Latin term ingredients, are listed alphabetically. Now, 
This is a loophole that the FDA has. Um, I wish they would change it and the All right, guys, so I have to apologize. My setup kind of petered out in the middle of that, and I didn't realize it until far too late. So uh, lighting's a little bit off, but we'll just finish up. So sneaky things that happen because of an FDA loophole is when you have a drug cosmetic product, the inactive ingredients at the bottom, anything except for that actual kind of drug ingredient can be listed a number of different ways. It can be listed alphabetically. It can be listed um, traditionally, so highest percentage to lowest percentage. They can basically list that any way that they want to. Just know that this is really hard to decipher when it is a drug product in the US because it could be listed any different way. So do not assume that the first ingredient is the most concentrated. Yeah, and there's really no way to tell what kind of system they're using to, uh, to uh, order their ingredients. They don't have to indicate how they're listing them. It's just kind of dealer's choice. So just to recap, real quick, drug facts on the backs of products uh, indicate that there is an active ingredient that the FDA deems to be a drug that is treating a specific condition. They will have a specific style of labeling that looks like this. Up here on the crimp, we have another expiration date that only applies to shelf life though. So this expiration date is not once you've opened it, once you're using it, um, that's how good, long it's good for. That's this can stay on the shelf until January of 2020 and still be considered fresh product and stable product. This little open jar indicator tells you how long after you open the product the crimp at the top tells you how long the shelf life of the product is. You have those, you have your indicators at the bottom that tell you if it's Leaping Bunny or um, no animal testing certified. Some may have the EU certification, so it tells you that the labeling meets that standard. And in general, if it's EU certified uh, labeling, that meets a higher standard than we do in the US. So. Uh, more scrutiny about how things are listed and and there's less gray area of, of how you can list things and what names you have to report. Um, in the EU, you are required to list all of the component ingredients. So if you say sort of a, a grapefruit extract, well, you'd have to list the ingredients within that grapefruit extract that are actually present. So ingredient lists can look a lot longer when they're EU compliant, but the, they likely are the same product that we have here in the US. It's just, you have to list a lot more in depth when you have an EU certified uh, or EU compliant label. Because we just talked about retinols and retinoids in one of my previous videos, I wanted to point out that that is an area of a little bit of concern for, for consumers. The reason being, some uh, manufacturers or some companies are using um, weird percentages to reflect the amount of retinol or retinoids that are in their product. Now, this isn't 100% them trying to be malicious or anything like that. It's just that um, depending on what kind of retinoid you're using, and what kind of base the product has in the formula, it presents to your skin with a different percentage than they may be listing. So when you see things that are listed over 1% as a retinol or retinoid, likely it is a blend of retinols or retinoid complexes. So a number of different retinol type ingredients that are working together and they're just adding that percentage up. It may be um, a true retinoid or retinol, retinol ester that is uh, able to be used in a higher percentage, but when it's put into a certain base, once it gets to the skin, it's actually a, a tenth of that percentage. So I'll link a video, Caroline Hirons uh, did a great video and she's doing a great retinol series that if you're really interested, you should all watch, but I will specifically point you towards a piece where she kind of explains uh, how that works and why there's so much confusion about retinol percentages. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it was informative. 
If you liked it, please subscribe and let me know down in the comments below what you enjoyed or what you'd like to see in future videos. If you didn't like it, again, throw me some comments down there. Let me know what you'd prefer to see for videos. Uh, if there's something that's lacking or something that's too much in these videos, by all means, let me know. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next time.